Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Model Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Karen Inder. And today I wanted to talk about, I've just been calling it things that affect your mental health that aren't mental health related, but like affect it, if that makes sense. Because throughout my like treatment and recovery and everything, uh, in speaking to so many different like talented professionals and, and, and skilled people who are aware of how a unique trauma is and how it affects the body and the mind from all these different fields. I just had to do a podcast talking about things to consider um, that may resonate with you or maybe like spark a little bit of curiosity and think like, hmm, like maybe I should uh, look deeper into that because at the end of the day, I always say, I don't care. I'm not like pro medication. I'm not anti medication, I'm not, you know, pro anything. I am pro getting you to where you need and want to be. And however you get there is fantastic. So this episode is kind of about that things that can affect your mental health negatively or positively uh, that maybe you haven't considered and maybe they'll make a a huge difference in your life as they have with mine. These are things that um, I never knew about. And then as soon as it was brought to my attention and I implemented it into my life, it's made a huge difference. So I just want to share. Um, The first one might seem like obvious. The first one is breathing. And This is something, I mean, you can't like, in the mental health world, you can't walk five steps without someone telling you to breathe. But I I don't want this to be like toxic positivity, like just breathe. That's that's not what this point is about. This is, this is actually, I want to talk like actually about breathing because I was doing physio one time and I was paired up with a like breathing therapist and I was just shocked at how little of our lungs we use and that it's a very common thing. So basically a lot of us are what's called shallow breathers. I am a fellow shallow breather and what that means is that we are not using our lungs to the like extent that they should be used. We're not breathing to the capacity that our bodies need. You're only breathing a little bit. And, and when you do this, everything kind of tightens and shortens and shapes differently. When you do breathing exercises, which is like fully filling your chest with air and you're stretching everything out, like that in itself is a stretch. And I know Maybe this is like the intention of a lot of people or like pose when they're like, just breathe, remember to breathe, you know, but I I don't want to just say, remember to breathe. I want to explain to you what's actually happening or not happening to the best of my ability because I'm not a breathing therapist, but this is just how it was explained to me. And maybe something that you can consider or work on or YouTube or find yourself a breathing therapist. And um, all you like really need is one session to kind of like get the grasp of it and understand what's happening. So with my breathing coach, um, I went for a couple sessions, but we worked on really elongating that part of my body. And, um, you know, it reduces anxiety. You're getting more oxygen into your body and it's also like a rhythm and it's a, so a way to a really great way to self soothe. I find now that when I'm trying to self soothe, I will breathe and then like hold it for four seconds and then exhale. Um, so I hope this just like explains a little bit deeper on what I mean by breathing. Like definitely something to consider. Um, also, if you have like an RMT, because uh, my RMT will uh, massage like my diaphragm. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Um, And work 
on getting my breath deeper into my lungs. So again, like makes the biggest difference with anxiety. Um, I highly, highly recommend. So that's the first one. Breathing, actual breathing. The second is one that, <laughs> I don't know, it's, like that. it's poop. I just want to say it. It's poops. It's your poops. So a lot of us are constipated and don't even know it. And so what leads to constipation, like stress, um, poor sleeping habits, sleeping hygiene, um, and oh, medications. So sometimes when you take a lot of medications for mental health, whether they're antipsychotics or antidepressants or anxiety, they can cause constipation. And you may notice it, you may not, but for as someone who was constipated for a very long time because of my medications, when I finally wasn't, it was literally a whole new world. Like for real, I couldn't believe how less irritated I was, how less anxious, how less, eh. and so the reason this is important is because it's to me, it's important to know like the origin of how we're feeling. Like if I'm irritated, I ask myself, why am I irritated? Is it because of anxiety? Is it because of stress? Because, you know, how you tackle said anxiety will be different depending on where it's being sourced from. And, you know, out of all those things, being constipated is kind of like an easy fix. And so I was always irritated all the time because I was constipated. How stupid is that? That is like the easiest fix. Boom, like fix your poops and you like suddenly you're not irritated anymore. And then your mental health like significantly improves, right? So this is the importance of it. Um, think about, <laughs> this is so, think about poops. Think about when your last poop was. Think about uh, like what your poop was like and talk to your doctor about your poops and just try to rule that uh, just, I guess, possibility out. So then you can feel better or at least eliminate that as a reason because one thing that could end up happening, for example, is that you know your constipation goes unidentified for a very long time and then maybe you're misdiagnosed. Like maybe you start taking more medications because you're feeling irritated and you need to relax when really you're just backed up and a little bit like a fiber goes a long way and you took those medications for no reason. So that's why this was like the, the inspiration behind this episode um, was talking about all these different things that can be easy fixes that don't require, you know, new medication or like more time spent thinking about it. But like, let's dial it back. Let's make it easy. Let's problem solve together. The next one. Um, so this one, really, I guess it's just pertaining to ovary having people, um, PCOS, polycystic ovarian syndrome. I was diagnosed with PCOS um, in around like June of 2019, I think. Um, I went my whole life not knowing. So there's, you know, you can read about it, you can Google PCOS, talk to your doctor about it, but if you have ovaries, then you could, um, like PCOS is an option for you to have. And the reason it's important to, to know if you have PCOS, which by the way, is just like a simple blood test, is because PCOS can affect your mental health, especially if you have like a diagnosis. So for me, being bipolar, uh, PCOS directly can affect my moods. And it's just good to know what you're dealing with. Like, you know, a bipolar person with PCOS versus someone who doesn't is like, is, it's just, there's a, there's a significant difference in maybe how I, the explanations for things or how I need to be treated. Um, you're also like able to change your lifestyle. So I learned, <clears throat> I learned that gluten and dairy are not my friend. <laughs> well, they're still my friend. They're just not like my best friend. 
when I omit gluten and dairy from my diet because I have PCOS, I feel so much better. And all of a sudden, I feel better because I removed something from my diet opposed to not knowing I had PCOS and maybe like going to the doctor, like describing symptoms of PCOS and being treated for something else other than PCOS. Do you, do you know like what I'm trying to say? It's just, if I went to the doctor and I was saying, oh, I just feel like crap. I feel like crap all the time. Without knowing I had PCOS, that might be alarming. Like, okay, you feel like crap all the time. We have to like, we have to fix this. We have to make sure that we, we get you to a life of high quality. How can we do that? How, what does that look like? Maybe more medication, different medication. Um, Either way, it's just lots of options that require time and they're frustrating and lots of problem solving. Whereas now it's like, well, you have PCOS, like, are you eating gluten and dairy? Like that will make you feel like crap. I cut out gluten and dairy, not all the time, but you know, like I'm not a perfect person and I enjoy gluten. But when I significantly decrease it in my diet, I feel like a new fucking person. Like I feel so much better and so different. And it's all because of that little change. So again, like this is why it's important. If you have ovaries and you're listening to this, um, maybe like there's lots of different symptoms of, of PCOS and a lot of people have um, the majority of them. And a lot of people don't have, you know, many symptoms. It's a blood test, something for you to entertain, something for you to discuss with your doctor. Um, talk to your doctor about the symptoms and see if maybe it's a possibility for you. The fourth one I want to talk to you about is sleep. Again, a lot of toxic positivity around this one. Um, just have good sleep hygiene. Just have good sleep hygiene. Blah, blah, blah. But let's talk about, you know, again, why let's dive deeper into it. Sleep is important for sure. But for some people who struggle with mental health, sleep is even more important. Um, and like, there's just, you know, again, trauma um, affects the brain differently in everybody. And everyone has a unique experience. And they say, you know, seven to eight hours of sleep is fantastic, which works for, you know, like my, my partner, for example. But for me, I need like, nine, 10 hours of sleep to be able to function. Um, also, because I have, I have PTSD, so my sleeps are a little bit more chopped up. Um, I don't necessarily reach a deep sleep of sleep paralysis um, and get to that really, really yummy, yummy REM cycle to really feel refreshed. I don't usually achieve that because my PTSD constantly keeps me in um, fight or flight mode and I'm tired all the time, which is great. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is why my sleep is even more important, right? This is so, and we know, like we know in this house that if I don't sleep, then my anxiety just goes through the roof and, I'm more likely to, for mood swings and I get um, overwhelmed easily. So sleeping is very, very important. Cool. Uh, but how can we have a good sleep? So those are just some of the reasons why sleep is important. But you have to practice what's called sleep hygiene. Sleep hygiene is like limiting blue light before bed, um, reading books that are calming, you know, limiting TV, limiting stressful content. Social media is really, really bad for before sleeping because it could be so triggering. Um, and just making sure that you have like clean sheets in a safe room and um, you're doing things for yourself that are setting you up for success, setting you up for success for your sleep. It's really important to talk about sleep hygiene um, and make sure that you are set up for success and what that looks like for you. And everyone is different. I take um, a sedative before sleep and, you know, I, I've been also entertaining things like melatonin, uh, but of course, always discussing with my doctors about what is best for me, but we can't ever like breathing and sleeping seem like such simple, easy, common sense, like duh things. 
but we don't take them like seriously. They are underappreciated, underdiscussed, undervalued. Um, I could talk about breathing and sleep forever because you hear it and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm breathing. Yeah, yeah, I'm sleeping. But that's for a lot of people um, and for a lot of people who struggle with mental health, that's just not enough. Like just going to sleep isn't enough. Um, we have to do more for ourselves, uh, more self-care, amp it up a little bit. Uh, so if you have any questions, like be sure to let me know. Um, can definitely like talk more about it. The next one um, is like toxic environments. Um, so this could be toxic work environments or toxic uh, like family situations, friends, like really anything like that. Um, <laughs> this is like one of the hardest to control because, you know, we all have family, we all have to work. What, what are we supposed to do? But I guess at this point it was just more so I want you to be aware of, uh, this is definitely something that's like not mental health, but mental health related that could affect your mental health and, and then negatively or positively and make it worse or make it better. But we have to talk more about our environments, our work environments, our family environments, and creating boundaries and creating space. Um, because I, I, one thing I've learned is that nothing is worth health. Like health is wealth. And if, if it takes a boundary or two, then that's something you should feel empowered and confident in doing for yourself. Um, but again, it's like, it's so sticky. It's so complex. Um, a lot of us don't have the choice, you know, it's a, a, a lot more difficult to like control in a sense. Um, but by constantly finding yourself, uh, in a, in a toxic work environment or family, it truly like whittles you down and just chips at your mental health bit by bit. And I don't know. It's like, if you can't leave a situation that's toxic, because again, like we're all in, you know, there's so many different scenarios that we could talk about pertaining to this point. But I think one important thing to do is be aware of it, acknowledge it, and then do what you can to protect yourself. Whatever that looks like to you, like it could mean so many different things. It could mean boundaries establishing boundaries with people. It could mean taking more like, uh, or like um, making a promise to yourself to take a full lunch break, to take a full break, to just take that moment for yourself to just leave the space and go outside uh, and do something that you enjoy to like regroup and reground yourself. Um, <clears throat> and also being able to stand up for yourself. So Again, this is just like another random point, <laughs> but it definitely, definitely plays a part in our mental health. So something to consider, just know that uh, I just hope that you have like the strength and the courage to make these choices for yourself because these situations when they involve other people can be the most difficult and most challenging, uh, especially when there's so many elements beyond our control. And of course, we all need to work. We all need to make a living and see our family and, and you know, have a relationship with our family. So it's all about assessing the situation, seeing what your options are, and promising yourself to make those changes in honor of your mental health. The next one, um, this one is kind of cool and is kind of like new but not new to me. It's basically eye tracking. Uh, I saw online the other day that it's also called brain spotting. Um, and I know that it's the concept or theory is also used in EDMR, I believe is the name of the type of therapy. But basically, um, how this was explained to me, was explained to me by my RMT, is that to like assess your eye tracking. So, you know, you take your finger for, so for anyone watching on YouTube right now, you can see me do it. But for anyone listening on a podcast, <laughs> um, you can just like look up eye tracking or speak to your, even like doctor about it. But if you do these exercises and have someone look at your eyes, they can tell you if you have an eye that's having difficulty tracking um, your finger or maybe 
it's a little like lazy. The reason that this is significant um, with, with surrounding the conversation with your mental health is because the way it was explained to me is that your eyes are taking images and pictures and sending them to your brain. The smoother that like path is or that transition is or that message is from your eye sending messages to your brain on what you're seeing, the smoother that is, you know, the, the, the better things are working and the less anxiety and the, the less your brain is having to work to process the image, images. If your eye is like mine, which it has difficulty tracking, so it's more like, ch 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 like chopped up images sending to my brain, that is create, that's causing my brain to work harder. And it's getting images that are chopped up and not complete, so I'm having to like complete the image. And this can literally cause anxiety. <laughs> it sounds so weird, but it's true. And so, there's exercises you can do to correct this. Like I do this uh, a couple times a day with my finger, track my eye. Um, we have been seeing improvements and it's also a great way to like check in with yourself, ground yourself, self soothe. And I've really even been enjoying like the exercise in itself. I find it very relaxing. So this is just something random. This is something so random that I just want to tell you. Uh, and maybe you can, discuss it with your optometrist or your doctor or your RMT about where your eyes are, where your eye tracking is. And if this is something that you need to work on, because it could literally reduce your anxiety. And I mean, when it comes to anxiety, I will try anything. <laughs> um, the next thing, this is the last point I want to talk about. Um, it's just literally like your body. So the reason I put this in here is because I just got a new RMT and she is fantastic. And she is really, really um, educated and knowledgeable on how emotional and mental trauma affects your brain. So one thing that we have been doing aside from the eye tracking is she has been uh, like working on and massaging a nerve in the back of my neck, like going up to my skull that stimulates a part of the brain that is often underactive after trauma. So trauma affects this part of the brain so significantly that it just like glitches, I guess. You know what I mean? If you were to if, just like to, to explain it. Uh, so what she's been doing is working that nerve to stimulate and get that part of, the, of my brain working again. And it has been, I don't know, like a really, really interesting uh, treatment. And yeah, I, I, I'm going to continue doing it. Um, I can say that for anyone, I guess, if you go out and do it, I can say that I feel the first time that we did it, I felt very sick. I felt very ill. I had to sit down, lay down for over an hour. And then the second time we did it, we, we you know, we of course cut it back a lot. Um, we only did a little bit and I felt better. I felt better than the first time, but I still had to lie down. But again, is one of these things I truly believe is short term pain, long term gain. I just thought it was a really, really interesting um, approach. And again, like I, I'm not a professional on the brain or nerves or like anything like that to explain it, but I, maybe I'll try and get someone on the podcast to like talk, talk about it deeper and further into just the science behind it and why it's been proven to help uh, trauma victims and victim or like people who have PTSD. But the reason I wanted to bring that up as well is just to like talk about things that aren't talked about. Um, Cause I find that a lot of us, we will go, I don't know, you talk about, you talk about medication and then you talk about lifestyle, but what about everything in between? And fortunately I've done all the work. <laughs> I've done so much work on, uh, on myself and for myself and for my mental health and my brain. And I am learning so much about how trauma uh, affects you and what it affects um, from poops to like nerves in your brain. So 
I just, the whole point of everything I do in advocacy is to talk about it and share things that have worked for me and share things that maybe you want to consider because I, again, I don't care necessarily like how, how I get there or how you get there. And by there, I mean like a high quality of life and the life that you want and a life that is easier um, to your definition, as long as you get there and it works, you know what I mean? And if, if, if any of these things are new to you or things that you're like, oh, wow, I've never thought of that. Maybe that'll work for me. Then that's awesome. Like, I am so happy that I was able to, to bring it to your attention and talk about it. So these are a bunch, I guess, seven things, seven things that aren't mental health related, but are mental health related. <laughs> so um, I hope it was helpful. Let me know what you think of the episode. And thank you for being here. And of course, um, thank you for your support. Uh, if you can share and comment and like this video, it would be so awesome. Because uh, it's, it's from that kind of support from you that we are able to do what we do and share what we share. So it is really, really appreciated. Um, thank you so much for tuning in. And we will see you next week. Bye, guys. <laughs>